bhavato arahato samma sambudasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambudasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambudasa amit to him the worthy one the fully enlightened one sadhu 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 Hey, so tonight we are going to look at um, the last link that's on our dependent origination examination. And um, one of the things that I ran into last week was uh, conversations about the deathless. And so I want to talk to you for just a minute if you haven't heard me say this before, that when we look at dependent origination this way, we are looking at it based on an operative basis of what operates the best for us to use this teaching in life. So how are we doing that? We are looking at the links impersonally, and we are looking at the links concerning how they operate with one event in our life that happens at a time. That makes it very usable. The three ways of looking at dependent origination, and one way, of course, is um, as a human being living a life and coming to the end, this is the one way, and we're looking at that that one got kind of confused in history, we think, uh, with uh, some Thai monks who struggled very hard to try to straighten it out because it got involved with eternalism. So what is eternalism and annihilationism? Short version. Eternalism is I am me and there's a soul that is part of me and when I die, I am going to go on life to life to life. This was the eternalistic view. The extreme of this I ran into in Oklahoma City, where one time with a woman standing before a monk who was explaining very carefully, uh, explaining to her, the family, what the Buddha was teaching. When heard that we didn't teach this soul, this individual person going on and on, she was just, you mean that my beauty and my self, this me, does not go from life to life to life? She was shocked and so absorbed in the outer appearance and um, her personality that this was an appalling thing for her to hear. So you have these different beliefs of needing to have an eternalistic view of the soul and going on and on in many different faiths, you find this. So that's the one way. And then, so that I call my, macrocosmic. Macrocosmic meaning we're talking about um, life to life over broad periods of time. This is the mac, largest uh, uh, way of scoping this and looking at it, okay? The, the smallest way is uh, when we try to see how fast these links are working, if we were to get involved in that and consider the links going 100,000 times over the circle, hundreds of thousands of times in the click of a finger inside my brain, this is microscopic and although we do have scientists who are just so enamored with the idea of figuring every tiny little thing out. They want to do that. But I look at that and I say, I don't see how the macrocosmic or the microcosmic is going to help these people who have a problem with their relationship right now, right here, or the man who can't keep a job because he has an anger management problem. How is it going to help him? Then I hear them say, you know, the Buddha, he taught the middle way. 
and the middle way of dependent origination to me turns out that someone studied that in the 1940s and it got lost after World War II, it got lost. His name was Dr. Harvey. And after the war, it disappeared and didn't surface again until in psychology, they have a thing called um, behavioral modification therapy, EMT, behavior modification therapy. And the behavioral modification therapist wants you to look at one thing at a time. And this is what I think that the Buddha was using, having people use this for in order to quickly change a habitual and this behavior that was not good. You want to change the direction, have some tools this work okay so the question becomes when they talk about the buddha saying that he teaches the deathless the deathless and we're going to look at that a little closer tonight what what does this mean the deathless and i'm going to get you to think some on that okay but right now i want to go um into the screen i'm not going to read this whole thing turned out to be a lot longer i don't know how I got away with this because Bondi was with me when I was writing this. He was still overseeing me. And how did I ever end up with one that was this long? But we're going to not read the whole thing. We're going to go through it and look at what, the, um, what it's talking about. So the first thing is I want to talk about the woman, the woman who, uh, the woman who, we talked about a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> we left her in the office and she was gonna lose her job. I think it's recounted here. And every Monday morning, uh, the woman on Monday, she would arrive at work and her boss would arrive and walk to her desk and pick up the weekly report. And she would get very upset because he would get so angry at her and she had composed it on Friday, but it's just statistics you know, from the different offices into this one office. And upon reading it, he would get upset and behave irrationally. And <clears throat> he, would, uh, he would get angry and displeased. At the same time, every Monday morning, she would make the assumption mistakenly, not being a trained mind, not, not knowing anything yet, she would make the assumption that his anger was being directed at her. And she started taking it personally. So she felt bad. She had headaches. She couldn't sleep. Her job was awful. She wanted to leave work. But someone suggested maybe if she studied meditation, she'd be able to sleep better. She goes to a temple. A Buddhist monk uh, teaches her about human cognition. And the teacher shares with her what a human being is actually composed of and starts to talk about her life experience in a different way for the very first time. They talked about it and he gave her some information to take with her about the meditation and guiding uh, this monastic explained to her how the sense doors work, the first thing we hear about. We hear about in our practice, when you were trained, you heard about the being being made up of a body feeling perception, thoughts, and consciousness, these five pieces. Now this monk is explaining to her what happened uh, when she experiences what's happening in that, in that uh, confrontation. So he gives her an example of contact and then how feeling arises and the craving arises in this case uh, as an I don't like it mind for her. And she it is tension and tightness, not her emotional reaction to the situation. Yeah, she's, she's working up to that. And then he says the craving is simply the arising tightness and tension in your mind and body, which fertilizes a seed for emotional reactions to follow. And uh, the monk explains how the clinging jumps up and very quickly, she starts running stories in her mind, much more stories than she needs about why you personally don't like 
the painful feeling that just came up. And the teacher, um, the guiding teacher explains to her how the habitual emotional tendencies will come up, that's the bawa, and that they can cause a lot of problems because this is where many of us live life by reacting instead of responding. She doesn't realize this is happening. He's explaining it to her. And the teacher then demonstrates how a person unconsciously uh, out, pulls out a, a familiar reaction from the habitual tendency library and plays it over and over again without any reason. So that link is where the emotional reactions live. To be precise, it's your own personal library in your head based on earlier life experiences, that cases of reactions you witnessed and it feeds a reactive behavior. It's your resource library for reacting. The library can offer us wholesome responses too, but most of the time it's not calm enough to come up with creative solutions. So it doesn't work in that direction. The heart of the matter is that most people don't slow down enough to see what's really essential in a situation when it's going on. And so they can't respond in new ways. They don't have any knowledge like you're learning here. And every Monday she hands over that report to her boss and cringes. She's summarizing the work from the week before and something about the report keeps making him really angry. Each time he comes in on Monday, he would come up to her desk, pick up the report, and then he would look at it with his eyes and she could see the demeanor change and the tension in his face arose. His face would get red and he would like feel, would look like he was in pain. And then like a boiling pot, he would boil over the edges and say something awful to her. No matter how she prepared for this every Sunday, it was always happened the same way every Monday morning. And she felt dismayed. She wanted to quit. So this was what we talked about last time. And he, he would speak badly to her and she was considering leaving her job because of this kind of pressure happening to her. And you remember uh, quite well uh, that what happened in these lessons, Q says, well, I ask you what happened. And he says, well, you reviewed with me how all of this actually works. And you talked to her about how her boss picked up the page and through his eyes, he saw forms. And you said that the eye consciousness arose and we looked at how contact happened for him. And next we talked about how since contact was arising, a painful feeling arose in him and how craving hit him when he thought, I don't like the pain, painful feeling. And almost immediately he got into his own story in his mind why he didn't like it. His clinging came up and then he pulled out a little card and he started to fire back with a habitual tendency at her. And I said, right, that's right, you got it. You understand it. That's how it works every single time. It's boring, never changes. Then all of a sudden he put forth a birth of action in the event and thinking angrily, saying something ugly to her, mixing the angry bodily reaction. And I think we are now up to the last link in the event, the aging and death. So now what happens? Now we have to stop and look at the last link in the process of cognition for the event. It's called aging and death. And this link is what helps us to uh, more intimately understand exactly what the suffering is, how it manifests and how it passes away. Because it is the last part of the cycle of dependent origination within this event that we can see from our angle of observation. The Pali word for this link is marana. But this does not nearly explain to us the entire situation of what this link is. Besides the link name, what else should we be beginning to understand? Well, this link is where we get to refine our understanding about what suffering is all about in more detail. And as it is happening, how it actually manifests. We hear a lot about aging and death, but we don't hear about the rest of the phrase that's attached to these two words, which usually label this link. And this causes an incomplete understanding about what actually is happening in this event. When you say only aging and death, actually this name is like an abbreviation of the link. It's like a nickname. I went running to Bonte said, you know, this is a nickname. 
It's not the name of the link. Because to fully understand the link, we need all of the symptomatic components of the link, whether we are talking about the end of a human life, or as in this case, we are talking about the single life event, like the arising of anger during an interaction between two people. So therefore we have to put on a stronger lens to see everything because the entire phrase which identifies the link is aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. And sometimes it's aging, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair, and then death because you get very upset during that time and all these pieces are working as the aging of the event is occurring. So, okay, it, is there a text in the canon we can consult uh, to define each of the symptoms of the link? Because one of the things I asked Monty a long time ago was, did he ever talk about this? Did he ever actually say what this or that link actually is? What, not the link, but the pieces inside? Or do we just keep hearing this phrase? So if we go to 141, our text, if we have our book with us, the Majima Nikaya on page one, um, 252. Okay. No, I'm sorry. That's, is that, is that right? No, wait a minute. Is that right? I'm sorry. I'm confusing myself. Uh, 1100, page 1100 of the Majima Nikaya book. Okay. Uh, you go down to where it starts talking about I'm, I'm putting you on the wrong page. It's 10, 1098, sorry, 1098, right. 1098, and you go to section 12 in the book. And what friends is aging? The aging of beings in the various order of beings, their old age, brokenness of teeth, grayness of hair, wrinkling of skin, decline of life, weakness of faculties, this is called aging. Now, when we're applying this to a human being, of course, this is a perfect description. If we're applying it to an event, one thing we can certainly say is there is a decline in the energy of the event, a weakness in the power of the event, and um, it's slowing down. That's what the, the aging is. The, a the aging process is going like sharp up, and then it's going down like this, going through everything until it comes to an end. And what is the death? The passing away of the beings. And here we can say the passing away of this particular event when we're looking at this phenomenologically. And that's the biggest word I have. <laughs> phenomenologically, we're just saying the passing of this event out of the various order of what's happening. Now this, the passing away, the dissolution, the disappearance, the dying out, the completion of time, dissolution of aggregates. That's the person, the human being, laying down of the body. This is called death, but it's the diminution, the dissolution of every part of that event that's fading out. Now you look at these at 14, sorrow. What is the sorrow? The sorrow is sorrowing, sorrowfulness, inner sorrow, inner sorriness of one who has encountered a misfortune or is affected by a painful state. That's your sorrow. And then at 15, what friends is lamentation? It's the wail, the lament, the wailing and lamenting, bewailing and lamentation of one who has encountered a misfortune affected by a painful state. And literally, when I was young, I would get so emotional at about 13 or 14 years old, I was tearing my clothes and I could see this bewailing and crying and so emotional if I didn't get what I wanted when I look back at a couple incidents like that that happened really just awful. That's what happens in these events. And then pain, bodily pain, bodily discomfort, 
uncomfortable feeling born of bodily contact in this situation, the tensing, the you know struggle in all the body systems when you're angry or when you're upset when somebody's being angry at you. And then what friends is grief? Grief is the mental pain, the mental discomfort, the painful, uncomfortable feeling born of mental conduct. I'm sorry, mental contact. This is called the grief. And what friends is despair? It is the trouble and despair, the tribulation, desperation of one who has encountered a misfortune or is affected by some painful state. It is called despair. And then it goes on here in here to explain more about not to obtain what one once is suffering to be subject to birth. There comes the wish, oh, that we were not subject to this birth, that birth could not come to us. Could we just get out of here and stop dealing with what's going on? This is not to be obtained by wishing not to be obtained by what one wants is suffering and to be subject to all these different things is subject. So he didn't not tell you anything about these. He actually broke these down and he um, went into them. So I put this here for you in here. And I uh, said, basically all of us have felt that we don't need to be reminded about the one about the aging. When we get to certain years, I think the most silly thing that goes on is in my head, I'm not old, <laughs> but my body doesn't want to keep up with what I propose to do. Sometimes there's a disconnect and that's a kind of frustrating thing for people sometimes when they're growing old. So all of a sudden then this hits home and you realize you have to come to a balancing point with between body and mind. You need helpers, you need somebody else to do some things, this sort of thing. Example, our physical work capabilities begin to decline and they lead us uh, to uh, the big, I want my strength back syndrome. And some of us will likely go off to a surgeon and beg mercy concerning some of the parts of our bodies, hoping that he can take them off and make a difference. But it might for a time, but impermanence will win out in the end and will simply go through it again. And our dissatisfactoriness is what's coming up for us. And then it shows what is going on with death, okay? And I wrote some stuff in here for you and talked to you about sorrow. Now with sorrow, after we break a precept, at some point we regret it in one way or another. And even if the sorrowfulness does not show on the outside, the inner sorrow can eat a person up alive. When you sit there privately, just suffering and suffering through something, depression can consume us. When we do not understand clearly how it can arise and how it can fade away. But in this situation, we're we are serving the suffering and sorrow, what this lady feels every time this event repeats itself in her office. And each time it happens, she takes the other person's actions very personally and blames herself for what was happening. Arising painful feelings will come up and then evolves into sadness, which is an emotion. And then she carries that out. And then in the case of this event with the lamentation, she laments what is going on before, during, and after the event, every time it happens on Monday, each time she holds on to the painful feeling. Therefore, the next present moment arises and goes by without her natural attention being able to be there. It's just not possible. She's caught. She doesn't have enough information. She talks to others about what's happening, laments over her job situation, but doesn't do any good. And um, this bodily pain also will show up as a headache and the mental discomfort is in an anxiety and her work, she worries about her future. That's what she was fretting about in the beginning of the story when she showed up. She can't sleep and she dreads every Monday morning but she's caught by uncomfortable thoughts, perhaps even tears arise after the whole situation when he leaves. And each time situation passes, afterwards she feels grief, mental discomfort, because she cannot see her way out of how this is happening. And she grieves at the loss 
of the peaceful environment and the whole event takes a lot of energy out of her. But the only way out is through knowledge and patience and forgiveness and understanding. And only then will a creative response be able to arise after she understands how everything is working. This has to be what happens. And but this can only happen if she understands what's going on. That's the secret to this, isn't it? Somebody says, you know, um, uh, the truth will set you free is the European philosopher's statement. And in Buddhism, it's um, knowledge and vision is what sets you free. And that is what lets you off this, all of this that's being in other situation. And you watch it. And then I can tell you here that she was living in ignorance and how things work. And she had no instructions to help her situation when she came. And here her mind is untrained and she will continue to fall into deeper despair. And this will further feed her depression and will only worsen without knowledge and vision in action. So that's what this is about. She's coming to find out in this case of birth, she wishes that there will not be a birth of this event again next Monday morning, every week. But she does nothing to change the fact it will happen. But this is not to be obtained by wishing, he says, and not to be uh, not to obtain what one once is suffering, to be subject to the aging, the sickness, uh, the death, the sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. And then comes the wish, oh, that we were not subject to all of this. And we go into despair over that. This is how the despair works. This is the end part of the sutta as far as I went with that. Now, so, so suffering is caused from not obtaining what one wants or obtaining what one does not want. In her case, she's going back in and obtaining what she does not want again and again. The woman in the office cannot seem to obtain peace in her mind in her workplace. So she desperately wants to stop the situation. She wants to stop it. But when the truth is here, this is the truth and you can't you can't change it once you're in it. You have to go through it. So we cannot change the truth. Does our discomfort always come from change or from the lack of it? Well, discomfort comes from both change and the lack of it. But we love to be in control, don't we? All of us here can probably remember times we really wanted to be in control. We do not internally understand that everything in the universe is always changing. We like to assume otherwise, and so we keep struggling. But nothing is permanent, and at the same time, change is not our enemy. It doesn't have to be. A lot of my students have decided Anicca is our friend, and I agree with them. Because when we change, we can't change another person. When we can't change another person, the change we must make is how we deal with the truth at hand, and then with a calmer, clearer, sharper mind. We can alter how the encounter takes place. This becomes a challenge. Now, this constant motion in the universe is normal. This is the nature of impermanence in this universe. It's a universal law, always changing. So suffering must be met with knowledge of how it works. And then through a new wisdom of the root cause of suffering, or I, person, I personally can change my perspective. That's what I can do, how I see things. I don't like this or that. Oh, it's only this again. Instead, we can change it that way, how we are going to look at it, how we are going to observe it. Once we know what something is and how it manifests, only then can we consider how to let go or get out, uh, let go out of its perspective and adopt the anatta perspective. Okay, do we have to replace it? Yes, we do. But why do we have to replace it? Why not just let it go of the feeling and keep going? That's only part of the equation because if you try to do that and suppress the feeling and try to go through this again and again, internally, you are going to continue to suffer at home, you're going to keep diving into depression. But this is, I, if she wants to keep her job, 
to also clear her mind and work with any idea of change for a full solution, she has to come up with something. The solution happens only when one abandons the suffering and replaces it with something else like a smile into it and lightening the encounter situation. This is where it sounds strange, but the people who really are doing well, really, really deeply well, can be measured by the level of their sense of humor in life. I didn't put that in here, but Bonte would punish me because he always says you, you measure your students by how light they become and they develop a kind of a pure kind of sense of humor. The solution happens only when you abandon the suffering and replace it with something else like a smile into it and lightening the encounter situation. The goal is tranquility and calm with a clear mind and sharpened awareness in present time living. And she'll think of something. Why does it work this way? Well, because there is a universal law that is stating the universe itself abhors a, a vacuum. This carries down to it won't if you if you just it if you have an unwholesome habit you cannot totally stop doing it just stop doing it and leave a hole unless you replace it new okay um this is about something about the energy around us it doesn't accept very well if we just change something by stopping it and not replacing it it wants us to fill the hole and so the idea of just um this is one of the reasons that when you just throw the hindrance away and come back throw the hindrance away come back throw the hindrance away and come back you're not replacing it with anything whereas when you're doing it the other way you're you're letting the hindrance go letting it go and then relaxing, smiling, and coming back. You're replacing it, you see? And that's a key to why people are moving uh, faster. That's what's fascinated me for the last 20 years is how can these people be moving that fast? But then when I see over a thousand reports now, and I can say, look, it's right there in the charts. They all do it the same way. The ones that move, easily down the path are the ones that follow the instructions precisely and they don't leave out. They relax, smile and come back. And the smile is very important, but the relaxed step is super important. And the solution the Buddha left us turns out to be perfect. It's called right effort, sometimes right striving. This is what's helping us to turn any situation into a more wholesome direction. Because when we practice TWIM using the six R's, we remind ourselves continuously to keep right effort going. And in each of the descriptions of the subcomponents of aging and death, the toughest part uh, is to realize that the real problem is the personal perspective of Atta, which is the opposite of the impersonal perspective called Anatta. It is our chosen perspective that gets us into trouble, choosing Atta. We didn't know we had an option, so let's be fair. It, anyone who hasn't been taught at all about this, they don't know there's an other way of looking at this. Anatta perspective is when we commit ourselves to seeing everything more impersonally. Each time we take things impersonally, our mind lightens up and relieves tension and tightness. It is best to try this for yourself to see what happens. Um, perhaps you can test this for a time as an experiment and just to notice the difference that it can make. We have several ways in which we can relate and experience in our life as being me, mine, or myself. But the heart of suffering involves our perspective. The I is what ignites craving. This is what the Buddha left you to figure out. He wasn't going to start just telling you that. He's, he's waiting for you to figure out the connection between the atta and the craving. The I is what sets the fire for the craving and starts pushing the wheel of suffering. That's where the energy comes for pushing the samsara wheel around. The moment that we take something personally and move into a defensive position, 
we will suffer every time. Taking everything personally, we always find ourselves reacting instead of responding. And this causes an arising tension and tightness in the mind and body. And it's where the conflict begins in the situation with the lady in the boss in her office. Okay. In past times, her boss always reacted and taking it very personally, she would then fall into her cycle of sorrow, then lamentation by lunchtime, pain and grief in the evening and despair every morning on Monday. And she began to see her mental, physical suffering more clearly once she gained more knowledge about how it all was happening. But upon retraining her mind a little bit and beginning to understand what was actually occurring, the secretary slowly eliminated her personal opinion of dislike of what was happening and began watching more closely the incident out of curiosity and the advice of the monk. And after a couple of weeks, she connected the dots and she could identify the cause of her suffering and notice the arising tension and tightness. And she realized that she could release this, relax her mind and her body would follow. And so she kept on smiling through the event. And when she stopped craving, clinging did not arise. And when she stopped clinging uh, the dis to discontent, habitual tendency did not arise. And when habitual tendency did not arise, birth of any more unwholesome reaction in this event from her, it just didn't occur. And when the birth of reaction did not happen, the sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair ceased. The texts then say this is the end of this whole mass of suffering by watching from the outside instead of taking in what was said personally she began to change on her side of this weekly event so for her like q says wow i thought we only saw this stuff in the text well we were writing about it the texts are instructions for living life more happily and successfully that's what they are and he says, she really did succeed in changing the outcome for herself, didn't she? She did. Now, I didn't put it in here, but because it was so long, but what happened to her was this became a movie. Instead of being on this stage with him on the other side of the desk and him saying this at her and her sitting here waiting and crouching and he's attacking her across the desk. Now she's sitting there watching this person go through this whole thing on Monday morning, like it's a movie. And she's beginning to see the frames of the movie, the frames of each part of his, of his uh, reaction. You uncovered more than just the habitual tendency here, didn't you? Yes, because it, it's, it's difficult to present habitual tendency by itself. Birth of action has to be demonstrated to see what is really going on. And then of course, the last part which describes the suffering clearly happens at lightning speed. It often seems to the untaught mind that the links happen almost together. They're so fast, but they don't. The all, they, it only seems true without observation skill that's developed. So once she develops our observation skill and makes this into a project and decided to just watch more closely, then after a couple of weeks, her confidence grew stronger. And she decided to make a comment that the report didn't seem to serve the office or him or her very usefully at all. And could she talk to him about how they might change it so that it would be more productive for everyone in the office? And what did he say? Well, they went and had some coffee and reviewed her ideas and he agreed to listen to what she thought. And during those discussions, she found out that he was having a rough time in life during the period of these reports. And things began to lighten up in the office and she kept her job and later on she got a raise. This is what actually happened in this case. As you watch things more closely happening in situations in life, 
the lens, uh, the, the line of the links make more sense to you, the line of the, these links, it makes more sense to you because eventually, just like her, you'll be able to realize nothing is really happening to her. This is a big thing. She came out of this with nothing was happening to me. Actually, everything was happening from me on my side of this. And she changed this and it affected all of her surrounding life. And so let me see if I can recap this. Okay, sure. I said, go ahead, give it a try. <laughs> Let's see. In this incident, you covered, he began to realize, she, she began to realize for herself from the point of contact, watching the movie, she saw feeling, craving, clinging, habitual tendency, birth of reaction. And she watched the aging and death and then her own sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair happening. She was watching the movie. Right now, do you begin to see how learning this impersonal process of dependent origination can make a significant difference for your own perception of a daily life experience? How you can come to respond instead of reacting? Yeah. He realizes this. It's it's really changes things when you know how life works. I can see how it becomes worthwhile to learn the links and watch them in everyday events. What do you call learning it this way? Well, it's not microscopic at the speed that it's really happening in your brain. And it's not macrocosmic theoretically across three lifetimes. It's human cognition that's examining one phenomenological event at a time and deciding how you can change your outcome. It's a middle way, isn't it? Yeah, it is a middle way. Watching individual phenomenological events and more simply events in daily life is what I mean by using the middle path approach to dependent origination. Once we have learned these links, then by reviewing single events in our own life, like anger, interactions, frustration, depression, anxiety, and grief, a person can get a better handle on how these events uh, took place, how they actually operated. And this takes away any of the mystery. When, when we don't know what is going on, this can lead to unreasonable reactions based on assumptions instead of information, which is a definition I used a long time ago where all conflict, all conflict between two people, two families, two neighborhoods, cities, country, states, anything, they always, the conflict takes place because there is an unreasonable reaction that is based on assumptions instead of real information. And that's why we have a lack of understanding. This is why the crises keep happening. And going over examples like this help us to know how the links come up and how the teaching gives us an immediately effective way of reducing suffering in everyday life. The approach has been very successful for people. Conquering ignorance helps them to quickly understand craving and clinging, which are at the heart of the suffering. So this is engaging Buddhism into life, absolutely. And it's using the practice in this way. It raises the value of the Dhamma in modern times. People begin to see how to live more peacefully by using the practice in their daily life, in interactions. Once again, offers a price solution and the teaching is very badly needed in the world of today. I think we need to promote this to young people so that they can embrace the technique in the future and move more strongly towards peace. This cycle must go around very fast and it certainly does. It happens thousands of times in the click of your fingers. But examples like this help us to understand the process is not impossible to see and apply within life situations. It's a priceless teaching. And he's saying, basically, it's a good lesson. It 
makes him smile and he'll see me next time because there, we, we went off this, um, we went off the, um, off the, um, what I was trying to say, <laughs> we went off the discussion syllabus a little bit because actually Bonte wanted comma to be the lesson in between birth and death, but we're gonna do that next week. Okay. Um, questions. Does anybody have any questions how this works? You see how it happens? I mean, Deepa, <laughs> you know, when I think of you, I think of, wow, <laughs> it's like you sort of talked to me this lesson when I had already written it and you came up with it after the retreat and it was spectacular. <laughs> You know, this is what you were talking about happening. It was so wonderful to see it. So the, yeah. um, mm -hmm. go ahead, go ahead. Uh, just wanted to um, make an observation uh, from my meditation that when the, when the self comes up in, in the consciousness, you know, then um, uh, the craving mind, you know, it's, it's like, it's like having a Velcro mind. Uh, whereas when when you are able to cultivate over a period of time the pure mind, then it's like having a Teflon mind. Huh? So nothing sticks. <laughs> nothing sticks. That's wonderful. No Teflon surface is wonderful. None stick. That's really really <laughs> nice. I like that a lot. <laughs> I do. Anybody else have experiences with this sort of thing? Yeah. Hmm? I can't believe nobody else had experiences like this, but okay. Um, one of the things people say, well, we're moving towards um, the, uh, the deathless, that this is what he's teaching. And then there was a big discussion this last week about the deathless, you know? And um, I wrote something last, um, actually it's almost a year ago now I wrote this, but, um, I wrote this and I'll read it to you because when I just talked to you, I was talking to you about the way of using this dependent origination on one event at a time. So when you listen to this now, I think maybe you'll understand the deathless, the deathless. What could the meaning be and how can this relate to our present existence? Through mindful observation, seeing clearly the impersonal process of all arising phenomena, one thereupon realizes an interwoven nature of this Buddha Dhamma. Released from the weight of flowing time, one experiences a remaining voidness of all states while knowing this is present. Upon giving up all craving and clinging towards any past or future concern, there is born a lightness of being, a change. Herein lies a counterpart, a deathless state, for nothing more arises and nothing passes away. The brain and the body are freed to reach their fullest potential, healing, and progressing to their purest completion for the remaining experience of this last existence. Such a peace should never be understated. Pure peace, pure stillness, and perfect clarity. So when you're practicing, what this comes from. Is abandonment. And when you continue to abandon and abandon and abandon you reach what we call pure mind. 
or still point. Within still point itself is a deathless state. For nothing arises and nothing passes away at all. So in the living period of the human being experiencing these states, we taste it. We can't be in it all the time. There's a great misunderstanding sometimes about um, the arahat, what happens when the person becomes arahat. And the, what I was running into this week was a lot of um, misconstrued stuff of, well, the aggregates aren't there anymore, which doesn't make any sense because the way out of that is simply to say, well, then how did the Buddha actually walk around for 45 years and teach? You have to put that together for yourself. There's a human being walking around and he has a body, he has a feeling, perce he's perceiving things, he has thoughts and consciousness and he's teaching. So certainly the aggregates did not cease at all in this situation. Um, they were in a chain, if you in your mind think of them, they were in a chain and, the, and they were working, hooked into the process of dependent origination. And um, what's basically going on is what it, the question came up right afterwards in the, in the conversation after I sort of pounced that one. <laughs> poked that one okay the next one was um well the next one was you know this person can't have feeling anymore but he does feel because he still has his aggregates operating but now on the wheel the wheel you see you look at the 12 pieces let's look if you write on a piece of paper okay Ignorant, you put the, put the 12 pieces, okay? So at the bottom you put ignorance, formations, consciousness, right? Then you put MM for mentality, materiality, right? And then six sense doors and contact, right? And then feeling and then craving. I'm sorry, is that right? No, wait yeah, feeling and then craving and then clinging then habitual tendency, birth and death. So you have 12 pieces sitting there. Okay, you read now, now right beside that. And I want you to write this down. You have, ig or just do it this way. Draw a line through ignorance. Ignorance is gone. Ignorance is gone, right? Formations in the human being still exist, right? Consciousness still exists in the human body, right? Okay. Mentality and materiality still function, correct? Six sense doors are still in the body, right? They're still there, okay? Okay. Contact still happens, right? And feeling still arises. And it is a feeling, a painful or a pleasant feeling. The proof of the fact the painful feeling still arises is the Buddha had a backache when he was in his near the, you know, he was older and he turned to, I think it was Sariputta and he said, I have to lay down, please give the talk. So the other person gave the talk and he got himself in a more comfortable position from this injury in his back. So he had a painful feeling, right? Okay. So the feeling was there and then craving, draw a line through craving because there is no more craving. There is no more functioning atta perception. Okay, it's gone. And then draw a line through clinging. It's not there anymore. There is nothing to do with your past, pulling up anything from your past at all. Stories, ideas, opinions, grouchy, grudges, anything. It's not there anymore. They've wiped clean. Okay, and there's no worry about the future at all. That's not there either. Okay, there's no clinging.
content. There's just nothing there. Okay. Now you are living totally in the in the present time space. Moment, 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 moment. You really are going living moment to moment because the birth of each moment takes place and you do have the birth of action. So you can't eliminate birth, okay? Because the birth of action until, it, but you, your, your energy towards another life is gone because you just destroyed this wheel. It all fell apart. Next time I will show you pictures of the broken wheel, <laughs> okay? So the... The wheel, you're giving birth to action, but no more reaction. Remember, so if you put out on the side, it was always reaction before you draw a line through the reaction. There's no reaction anymore. There is only action, okay? And then you have the death of events that occur for the eye, ear, nose, tongue, and body. Certainly these events occur, they arise, they exist, and they pass away. So it's happening still, okay? However, you do not have, upon the death of any event, you can cross out sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. Cross all of those out. Those were the components at the end, you see? So now you have a completely different look. Wait just a second, I have it right here. Hold on. I just thought of it. I actually have it right here. So now all you have left, you started out with, yeah, let me show you what you started out with. Um, I know you did. Okay, do it this way. Okay, we'll show you this way. <laughs> now, this wheel, can you see it? This wheel, that's what you thought was in your head. You see the direction it's going? It's turning this way, you see it? Okay? And then some monk comes along. <laughs> And he says, you know, that wheel, it was designed to go the other way. <laughs> and you say, it was? So it was supposed to be turning the other way. And all my life, I was trying to force it to go the wrong way. And he says, that's because you didn't know how it was put together. Okay. And see, what is happening is that wheel, when it's going around and you start practicing the rope, is when it, that rope that's extended the hook to the wheel, uh, that is sort of your training session. And the more that you train, the more this wheel is going to change. So the first thing is it's hooked on the birth of reaction. And when you pull on that, as you're practicing, when you pull on that, the wheel is going to start to slow down. It's not gonna be able to operate anymore. So here's where you broke this habit. You realized habitual tendency was causing this to break. And so you pull on it and pulled it at habitual tendency. And then the birth didn't happen anymore. The birth of reaction. And then after that, you kept practicing and you have to go to these other pictures. You pulled some more and after the habitual tendency, you kept practicing and broke it at clinging and habitual tendency. When you pulled that one out, clinging pops out of the rim and it starts to collapse the wheel. Pretty soon the rim breaks and the rim snaps off. Everything's loosening up now in this picture. If you can see how everything is actually starting to really break. I think the one that broke was, um, uh, yeah, the, 
the one about clinging and clinging and just before you start to have trouble real big. And this is the whole wheels broken down. This is an irreparable wheel of an Arahat. It's all pop. There's no way we are going to put this wheel together. But he doesn't quite have fruition yet, maybe. So we go to one more wheel here. Because the question after we did these, all these drawings, the kid, they were bugging me saying, but what's left of the Arahat? So we, we, I'm not very good at drawing. We had a meeting and we said, well, these pieces are what are left, okay. But they should be just like pieces that are floating in a bowl of water. That's what the image a lot of people came up with. They're just these pieces that are left are the are the parts they shouldn't be. But everybody said, no, no, he went on living for 45 years. Let's give him a smaller wheel. <laughs> so we made a smaller wheel. And these are the parts. And I'll tell you who's here. Just as I told you in the beginning, you have formations, OK? consciousness, mentality, materiality, the six sense doors and contact, and then feeling, and then you have the birth of action. There is no more, it's a response, the birth of a response. There is no more reaction anymore. That's what's this, what's this wheel. And it keeps going until in the end, the very end, we didn't do one. <laughs> I thought we had one more. And in the end, the I liked the idea. I just wasn't very good at drawing the perspective of a really like a bowl sitting here like this. And the pieces are floating in water. And when the person passes away, okay, when they're gone, the bowl breaks. And the pieces inside just go like the sand castle that falls down. And it makes it impossible to reconstruct the person the same way as they were before. Okay? That's what's happening. We equate the Arahat to um, the sand castle very well. If you've been on a beach doing sand castles and um, then you put it close enough that the tide will take it away. And the granular parts of the sand in the sand castle are just going to go down into the water. And that's it. There's no way that you can take that and put it back together again. You see, only upon fruition can that happen, the fruition of the chip. Okay. So the big deal for this person who is watching, coming back to the woman and the guy in the office. She used to watch him and eventually she explained some of this to him and she explained, he said, why did you, you seem so, she seemed so much calmer, it was easier for him to calm down and they changed the report. But the thing was, because she was watching him, honestly watching him as if she had gone into a movie theater and she was watching this person in front of her on the other side of the desk and this was her experience. She was watching dependent origination function from her perspective on her side, calmed her down, let her sleep. Meanwhile, she's looking at the challenges here and the challenge to get him into a space where she can make the suggestion, you know, this report is not working for me, it's not working for you, it's not helping anybody. So it's just making this whole office, everybody here is upset. How can we fix it? He realizes, well, what do you think? And what do I think? And let's go to the home office. And they did, they fixed it. Okay, so that's my story on uh, the dependent origination. Now, the next week. Does anybody have any questions about what we did tonight? Mm -hmm. I, I, no, I just, I, I'm glad that okay. you, that you got through all that explanation because I was thinking about deathless and then, um, you know, I was thinking, well, is there such a thing as birthless, right? But you explained definitely that 
that there is a birth of action, you know, the, the difference is an action that is reactive versus an, act, an action that is active. So, I mean, um, yeah, um, that is a response. Yeah. A response yes. instead of reaction, yeah. right? Uh -huh. So that, right. So that, that explained what I was, what I was having in my head about, well, if there's such a thing as deathless in, in, in the microcosmos, you know, uh, would it be something also as as birthless? See, but now, there, now that's clear. Um, yeah, for the, the thing about the deathless thing is you sit there and try to say, how do you explain this to somebody? Okay, if nothing's born, nothing dies, right? So the whole discussion about the deathless can be taken to the macrocosmic realm of a human being and play it that way or bringing it back to... Uh, to microbiology and doing it that way. <laughs> or if we're looking at this situation, if she can't be upset anymore, there can be no birth of, you see what I was doing with her is there can be no more birth of sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. There can't be if nothing arises in her anymore. If she gets clear enough about how something works, then she begins to get curious. What does it look like? Can I see all of those pieces working? Now she has something to do in this dichotomy that's happening between the two of them. She had nothing to do before except be afraid, become oppressed, become fall into depression and a great deal of sorrow and woe and anxiety and harm for herself. Now it's not solved, but now it turns into, I wonder what would happen if I do just sit here and I watch him do this without any reaction at all. It's kind of like the guy who pig pulls your pigtails in third grade, does it because you squeal. <laughs> and then when you cut your hair, what's he gonna do in class anymore? Once you put it up in your head and he can't pull it, what are you going to do? <laughs> what can he do anymore? You know, so you took out, he, he had no target anymore because she's, well, here's the Monday report. And you, she gives it to him and goes like this and tries to watch dependent origination. See, now she's just watching this out the corner of her eye while he's doing it. And it doesn't matter to her anymore. It doesn't touch her. We also told her some tricks. We told her to put herself in a meta bubble. And we told her, remember, if you have a defense grid around you, a meta bubble, and you're just smiling and watching, trying to see if you can see how many of the links while he's doing this in front of you, then you're protected, you see? So she had something to do from her side and him, he had to figure out how funny he actually was, you know, and even if there was something bad going on in his life, finally he can get in touch. He's not using her as a target anymore where she can be hurt. She can't be hurt anymore. Okay. So that's what was happening there. Okay. Deepa, did you have something? Yeah. So um, the idea of a soul um, is that then, um, you know, so every, all of us, I mean, I don't know what, what you would say, we, whether we have a soul or would you say that we, we are just uh, a unique combination of the five aggregates? You know, everybody's going to answer this differently. <laughs> um, I've had enough experience with people now that can do OBEs very clearly. I, I have a suspicion at some point anthropologically in, in ancient times, somebody came up with this idea of there must be a soul. I see you on the bed. I see the energy body floating above it. So how can there not be something else? Let's call it a soul. Now, soul is a funny word because in Germany, they call it the geist and it's the ghost. They have, they call it the ghost. They don't have a word for soul in, I think it's Russian too. We had some problems there too. But, but in talking about soul, where soul, where this went, can you picture this like two 
a caveman and his wife is sick and as she's sick she separates and then he's the chief of the tribe and he starts talking about the other person and then it goes from there to soul and then who knows you know maybe we have another person people can see auras and some people can see energy and um I can see that it came from there. I don't know because I did not study early religion, so I don't know what they say. Does anybody here, did they read, um, what's that big book? Ends with a C. Campbell, Campbell's book about everything. The man Campbell wrote the book, big book about human beings and how it all got started with religion and all this stuff, anthropology. I don't know what he says about it. I don't know what where that goes. This is just coming from me. Okay, now look this, at this. Is this not the hero with a life. thousand faces, right? This is not the hero the with a thousand faces. The, the hero with a thousand faces by Joseph Campbell. Is that the one you're talking about? Yeah, I think so. And it went through the whole thing from the beginning. I think that's what I'm talking about. Okay, and here's the thing: the idea of um, relying on somebody else is a natural thing for human beings to want to do that. You know, if you've been through a really bad time in your life, you want to believe you can have a relationship. For instance, Christianity is um, God and Jesus and the Holy Ghost. You got three chances there. Okay. <laughs> God is here and Jesus came and went and that whole story is there, but you also have um, the Holy Ghost. And, and, and I was um, a Mormon for seven years. And the Mormons are very big on the relationship with the Holy Ghost. And women are encouraged to have a relationship with the Holy Ghost. No matter what happens, you have this, this other support person there when think seven or eight kids or nine kids are around. And um, you rely on this. It feels very good to feel like you have somebody with you. You get a lot stronger if you think you're not alone. And then taking that away was an interesting experience, but you can't take it. I don't think you can take it totally away. I'm not sure where it exactly went with me, but, but um, I don't rely on that anymore. I see, I, I, I get more interested in watching what's really happening, you see? And I have, um, I am one of those people that if you crash your car on the highway and I go by, I'm gonna stop and get you out of the car. I mean, I have a reputation from the time I was 16. I think I did it about seven times in my life where I came upon an accident and stopped and got the people out of the car and down on the ground before the car burned up or something like that. I don't know why this keeps happening to me, you know, but that's just something I do where other people would drive by. And um, where does this all come from? Why was I strong enough to do that? when I wasn't the way I am now, because I felt like I, that was what I did and that's what I was taught and I would do that, that's how I was raised, see? So the answer to the soul issue, Bhante Dhamma Gavese, you have any ideas on this? Where'd the soul come from? Uh, soul comes uh, basically uh, from the idea that uh, there is a permanent uh, self and thus uh, that self uh, should have, uh, there are different views on uh, how the self would uh, manifest. So one of those uh, things is that the self is at the core of uh, the physical body and that is uh, uh, kind of soft and, uh, and it, it, is, uh, it does not have any kind of a mass, but it, it, it survives the body and uh, from one body to another body. So this is one view. And there are other views also in suttas which says that the body is the self or the self is in the body and uh, and uh, some uh, uh, those combinations. So basically it comes from the permanent uh, nature of being. Does, I remember that one sutta that was saying all the different things that weren't true. Yeah, and he was going through it about the self. Yeah, yeah. The... Um, you know, you would never say to somebody, it's not real, it's not there. It's something you have to get to with your own self within your own, with, the, with your own you balance. Uh -huh. Yeah, your own balance of understanding. And um, one of the creepy things that happened to me was um, with Buddhism was fear just went away. 
how can I explain it? It wasn't just fear of heights. Fear just went away. And this had happened. It was starting to happen before I was work, uh, working with Bonte. Um, because some things happened that were, you reached a point where all of this has got to stop. So I was asked to, to speak to people, to certain people. And uh, these were people that no one else would dare go and speak to them. They were scared to death of talking to them. Very high legislators and things like this. And um, I never had any fear of talking to anybody. If I needed to explain what was going on and stand up for somebody else. It was when I was doing um, legal support work for um, mental health I was doing, they call it um, independent citizen advocates for um, mental health citizen advocates. And these are people who have depression and they have to face an arrest. And when they get in the system, they're so upset. And most of the systems that they faced didn't know they needed to have their medications. And it was a big, huge mess. And it was in many states in the United States have a big problem with this. So my job was to work between uh, with the take the client that they gave me and uh, make sure that they knew what their attorney was saying to them at attorney meetings, but also deal with the judge and deal with the um, any anything that was when they were oppressing them in the legal system. I had to stop it, you know, because these these people that work for I don't know if you know in our country public defenders. They don't, they just get paid a little bit of money by the state. And to be a lawyer, you have to do it every so often. And when they did it, some of them were in a hurry. <laughs> and some of the people's lives depended on these people. And so I was the person in between, but th they just wanted to intimidate you. And I used to laugh and say, you know, come on, let's sit down. We need to talk about this. Stop pretending to intimidate me, just stop it. And we have to look at what's real and what the law says. And they, and I, I don't understand why I could do that, how I could do that, except I just, um, something happened with fear. And, and then the second year I was working with Ponte, that's when everything really um, got that way <laughs> very, very, very strongly. Because I had some very deep experiences and I realized who am I to worry about anything? It's nothing here. There's nothing here. There's nothing there. Then why not go and take care of something or someone else? Why not? There's just nothing there. You see? So this is something you can experiment with and see where it is that it frightens you and what is the craving that, that grabs you or scares you and then go beyond it and see that you come out the other side. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, what you what you were talking about just now about the Arahat and, uh, you know, uh, so there is this idea of a human being having a physical body, a mental body, an emotional body. Are you saying that what an Arahat does is basically completely dissolve the emotional body? Oh, yeah. But it's not okay. I don't remember uh, who, when they started with three bodies. I know I read about that in some places, but you have a physical body and you have a mental body makes perfect sense to me in relationship to the Buddha, okay? And um, the emotional body is the heat of the reactions and everything, but see that there's all this stuff about emotions now, like we want to welcome our emotions and don't defy anger. Almost, I heard one man from Canada saying, don't even stop the anger, let the anger flow. And I'm sorry, I don't agree with this because where you need to go back to is how this is operating. And the person, when you show them clearly enough, succinctly enough, this dependent origination. And then they realize this is where it's coming from. The I, me, my, and mine, the personal grabbing on, believing it's part of me. You can't take this away. Well, you're not taking anything away except the damage that it's doing to you and other people. And how you, you, you can uh, give an excuse, well, I'm this religion and when I'm I can do anything I want because I'm emotional. No, you can't. 
this is out of control right now. And I, I don't know, um, I, I don't know what the solution to that is really. Do you, <laughs> you have to, for, you can't, you, the thing is one thing, one woman said to me, well, you know, if somebody came after me, well, I can't stop them. I should just allow this to happen. I said, no, Buddhism never said that you were supposed to be a doormat and people were supposed to walk all over you. Nobody said you can't move out of the way. You see, you start by working to forgive someone and then sending loving kindness, depending on how strong your loving kindness energy is working. Um, that is a lot. And the compassion and, and energy, uh, metta and karuna energy is flowing. People won't touch you. They won't. Okay. Especially if somebody's coming at you and you turn and you smile. You know, there's a story of um, one time uh, that Bunty was in a place in New York City and he was staying. I don't know where he was staying at the time, but when he went for a walk by himself, he went a few blocks away in the wrong direction. It's easy to do in New York. <laughs> okay. And he went into an old abandoned warehouse district that was not a place to be taking a walk. And he was walking along, just along the pavement with his, his bag. And that's all he had. And then out the corner of his eye, he realized there was somebody coming beside him on the street from behind a car and it wasn't coming past. So finally, it was coming very slow behind him. Finally, he, um, he stopped and he turned around just as the guy got out of the car and he came toward him and he was kind of a big tough guy, but Bonte wasn't interested in the appearance of the man at all. He was only interested in the bandages that were on his hand, on his wrist and around his hand, because he could see that the man had injured his hand. This was his immediate assumption was he had injured his hand really badly. Well, Bonte's a healer and so stopped and um, he, uh, said to the man, you've hurt your hand. Can I see it? I bet you, I, I, I can probably help you. Can I see your hand? And the man withdrew his hand away and he looked at Bonte right in the eyes. And Bonte looked him right in the eyes. He said, honestly, I can help you with your hand. Let me see your hand. And the man was taken aback again. Why? because he could feel the energy around Bonte. He could feel the energy around him, just pure loving kindness around him. And what happened was he shook his head like this, the man, and looked down. It was like, no way, I'm, I'm gonna get back in the car. And he turned around and walked back, got back in the car and he told those men to drive away and they did. Now Bonte just turned around and he started walking and he told me, um, after that, he put it together in his head and he said that man was getting out of that car. He had brass knuckles underneath his hand and he had it wrapped in a bandage and he was going to beat him and take his bag and he knew it. He knew that's what he was going to do. There was nobody around anywhere to help him if that had happened. And then he thought, so what? <laughs> he just kept walking but he put it together. That's what was actually happening because he said that man was in his, when he reran the film in his head, it was like his shock of this man's face. You see, and it's not gonna touch you. If you assume people are going to come after you, they will. If you assume that a bunch of dogs are gonna attack you, they will. If you assume cats are gonna come after you, they will. If you put out a lot of loving kindness to them and take it completely out of your head, most of the time these animals will just feel it and they'll come right by you or back off, they'll go away. This is true. I wouldn't instruct people, children to be doing this because they make a mistake of reaching to touch a dog like this. If this is the dog. Don't ever, ever reach like this to touch the dog. You always reach like this to the dog. 
with your hand, like there's something in the hand, would you sniff my hand? If I could get down, I'd sniff your nose. <laughs> horses too, horses behave the same way. But don't ever go to touch the horse, go up to the horse, you see? This is just animals, <laughs> it's animals. They're that way, yeah. So we detect things and we have uh, these, uh, the, the meta is meant as a, uh, not only as a defense, um, but it talks about the cancellation of the ill will, the cruelty, the discontent and the aversion, but also building up the strength of your meta and being able to um, use your Karuna, stay in the um, level of Karuna and into the space and stay there for an hour and build it up and keep smiling and smiling. And then you go out and it's nobody's gonna bother you. They're not, you see? Any other questions? You're okay? Okay, I, I was gonna ring my bell tonight and I was in the other room. <laughs> I can't. I'm confused now because I'm in my room doing this here and I haven't put the green screen out in the dumb hall yet to do it out there. So I'm still. So, any other questions? Can we finish, John? Then, okay. Okay, that's so. Okay. Closing. May suffering ones be May suffering, suffering free. Free. and the fear struck fear as be. May the grieving the at all grieve and, and may, may all being find relief. May all being share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May being inhabiting space and earth. Devas and no, Nagas of mighty power share the spirit of ours. May, May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.